Welcome, everyone, to the University of Florida Water Institute's monthly seminar, our Distinguished Lecturer Series. I'm Carol Lippincott, and I'm a research coordinator at the Water Institute. Wendy Graham could not be here today because she is in Washington, D.C., serving on the National Research Council Committee of some sort. But we welcome you, and we welcome Dr. Edgardo Laturbese. Edgardo just received several months ago a Distinguished Professorship Award. He is the Raymond Dixon Centennial Professor in the Department of Geography and Environment at UT Austin, University of Texas, Austin. And Edgardo is also head of an international research program that emphasizes the study of large rivers throughout the world. The name of that program is Large Rivers, Long-Term Basin Evolution, Morphodynamics, and Global Change. He is considered by his peers to be the most experienced field geomorphologist in tropical South America, particularly in the Amazon basin. And in fact, Edgardo has conducted field work in almost all the countries of South America, not just the Amazon basin. He's worked in the tropics of Southeast Asia. He's worked in the Mississippi River in the United States, as well as in countries in Asia, Europe, Australia, and Africa. So truly global work. Edgardo has received many honors. Uh, one of them is that he's recipient of the Gilbert Award for Excellence in Geomorphological Research, which is awarded by the Association of American Geographers. He serves as a consultant to several environmental and water resource agencies. And in his consultancy, he serves as a geoscientist specialized in environmental sciences planning and management. So a few of these consultancies are the United Nations Program for the Development, United Nations Environment Program, the Organization of American States, the International Atomic Energy Agency, and the Geological Survey of Brazil, among many others. Um, finally, Edgardo is a member of the editorial boards of Geomorphology and of Paleoecology of Africa. So with that, we welcome you to the floor. And there is Pointer Advance. Well, thank you very much also for the advertisement. It looks pretty nice. <laughs> it was easy. <laughs> it was easy. <laughs> thank you. But uh, before I start with this uh, topic, I would like to thank deeply to many of the people present here, the Water Institute, of, of course, uh, because of the invitation, but uh, particularly to uh, colleagues from the networks of the Amazon dams, uh, we interact together a bit, uh, uh, they bit uh, Simon and many others. And uh, I have been here before a long time ago. So this is my second visit to Gainesville. I was visiting this lady over there, Sharon Moster from the Department of Geography, also a fluvial specialist more than 10 years ago. I don't want to, probably we need some radiocarbon dating to know <laughs> the, the pres date. So it's, uh, it's very nice to be uh, here. Um, I have a former student now that also is working in Florida, Anwar in the Department of Geography, so I feel like I'm at home. Uh, I'm going to present some of the results that we have. Uh, uh, of course, this is part of uh, not only my research, but part of my team, collaborators, and so on, uh, on South American rivers. And uh, the idea is to show you uh, some results on fluxes at continental scale. Let me introduce, allow me to introduce what we are doing in Texas. Uh, so I have this program, like Carol explained to you, uh, large river long-term basin evolution, morphodynamics, a global change. is pretty ambitious because uh, under the umbrella of fluvial research, I am covering different uh, aspects. Uh, on one side, uh, uh, the historical part of uh, the geological history of some rivers so how we reorganize this basin through time, for example, since the late Cenozoic, uh, long-term basin evolution at continental scale, the quaternary uh, is history of this river as well, and the production of routing of sediment at continental scale. So we can uh, link this to how sedimentary basin behave today. And this is part of the presentation of today. But additionally, we have the more actualistic uh, stuff, it's the hydrogeomorphological research, uh, trying to assess uh, eco-hydrology and human impacts uh, 
on the river management, and conceptual research in morphology and geomorphology and sedimentology, <coughs> particularly how we develop anabranching patterns in big rivers. Megafans is part of the study of uh, Anwar here. It's a global assessment of megafans, floodplain evolution of large rivers, and fluvial-eolian interactions in land floodplain. Here you see it's pretty broad, and we try to link past and present mainly, and of course trying to contribute to the discussion of future. So we are uh, 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 studying many of the largest, largest rivers of the world. In the South America, we have a bunch of them. Some work in the Mississippi as well. Now we, I expand to Southeast Asia, working with the Air Observatory of Singapore <coughs> in Borneo and the Irrawaddy, and the largest megafans in South America and Africa. So this is the topic of today. I, the school I, I, I developed is basically a mixture of traditional geology or quaternary geology with uh, morphodynamics. So for quaternary research, we use these uh, traditional tools, you know, uh, and I integrate with other colleagues uh, information from other proxies like paleontology, vertebrates, and vertebrates, palynology, and so on. Uh, sedimentology, stratigraphy is a typical approach, uh, course, and uh, geophysics. Um, datings in the, as, as well, normal standard stuff, OSL, uh, LED, radiocarbon, datings, geomorphologic mapping and uh, geologic mapping. We do a lot of that. In many of these areas, we don't have very good maps, so we have to develop this mapping. Uh, and a lot of field work, I'm a field guy. So uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying, of course, we are doing some modeling, but I consider my, my, myself like mainly a field-based uh, uh, guy. So in terms of river morphodynamics, <coughs> we also collect a lot of information in the field. So we do a lot of uh, field expedition in these big rivers. And we use uh, any kind of boats, whatever is available. As you can see, small bigs. We in the Amazon, we use these big sometimes like a base. This is the Madeira River, for example. And we work during the day in these small ones, and we sleep by night in the big one. Uh, it's like a floating base. Uh, we use the basic uh, equipment that we, we can use uh, today with the te available technology, acoustic Doppler profilers, uh, side scan sonars, mainly single beam echo sounds. In the Mississippi, of course, uh, we have access to more technology, so it was possible to use multi beams as well. Sensor bottom profilers, we collect samples, uh, cores, and, and, and this kind of, uh, of, of, of uh, stuff. Uh, after we process this in the lab, so we have to get, uh, you know, uh, information on suspended sediment concentration or ground size and uh, geochemistry of the sediments. And uh, we have also the capacity in my labs to do uh, lead to 10 analysis to get uh, recent chronologies uh, to estimate sedimentation rates and the modeling with computers and uh, all this uh, uh, post-processing and that we have to do. Uh, in our lab, we have a special sector for remote sensing. Uh, so we see this is more or less what we do is it in terms of, uh, of uh, research. Uh, the, the approach that I'm going to apply today is a kind of source to sink. Why is this source to sink an uh, interesting approach to an analyze the fluvial basins? Because uh, provide interesting information uh, that uh, can be useful to develop quantitative model of landscape evolution, Shock chemical and sediment mass balance, estimating the intensity of continental and regional erosion, all this stuff, uh, how much uh, sediment we can transfer to the ocean and how much we are trapping in the continents. Uh, and of course, we have a lot of applied uh, aspects about this. It can help us to design better strategies of fluvial basin management, that is something that we are interested in, uh, and to assess and mitigate hazards of different types. And uh, uh, in the term of ecology, to link these fluxes the, of, the, in the, uh, 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 of the fluvial system, trying to link the hydrophysical functioning and the uh, fresh water and coastal ecology. So this is what we are looking at, so how much we produce, how we transfer the sediment and water toward the ocean, and what is going on in between the source and the sink. Why South America? I believe that it's a beautiful continent to do that uh, for several reasons. Uh, we have the longest mountain chain in the planet, that are the Andes. It's very asymmetric, as you see, uh, 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 land. We have uh, short rivers going to the Pacific, huge basins going to 
uh, the Atlantic, basically. Uh, we have uh, the longest and probably and continuous and more extensive foreland system, basically, as well, all along this huge uh, backbone that these uh, are the Andes. We have also huge lowlands. So think about uh, Africa, that this is, can, is a continent that doesn't have too much mountains. Well, the mean elevation of Africa is higher than South America, right? Because we, we compensate uh, the elevation with these big uh, uh, lowlands. Uh, the largest river of the planet are here. The largest alluvial megafans, fluvial megafans of the planet are in South America. And we also have major intercratonic and continental sedimentary basins. So the Andes are a big barrier in terms of climate. How you know, all the moisture precipitate east of the Andes, practically all the northern coast or central coast of uh, the west part of uh, South America is very arid, uh, with exception of the northern part. Um, and does it produce this uh, asymmetric continental divide. And additionally to that, it's a very well-drained continent. When we compare some areas of Asia, even of North America, the drainage integration, the integration of the drainage network is really extreme. Uh, and you can see that the few basins practically drain good part of the, uh, 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 of the continent. Mm? So I'm going to discuss an example. Well, this is a, how is the circulation, how is block the circulation. And we are at the largest river of the world in water discharge. Well, these are the 10 largest rivers of the world in water discharge. And say, well, we don't have 10, we have seven. Why? Because the Yang said, the Brahmaputra, Congo, Amazon, Orinoco, Paraná, and Mississippi. Three of these guys are in South America. The problem is that say, we consider that the Amazon is out of scale in comparison to other uh, basin of the war, because remember that the Amazon is basically five times bigger than the Congo, that is the second one in water discharge is that many of the tributaries of the Amazon are among the largest rivers of the world in water discharge. So these three tributaries of the Amazon are in the select group of the 10 largest rivers of the world in water discharge. These are the Madeira River, the Negro, and the Chapura Caqueta, the, we can change the name in Colombia or, or, or Brazil. And these are the 10 largest rivers of the world. So one, two, three, four, five, yeah, we have six of the 10 largest rivers of the world uh, in South America in terms of uh, water discharge. Eh? Correct. So it's a real paradise. When we put this into the context of tropical river, 24 of the 34 largest rivers of the world in water discharge um, from the tropics are in South America as well. What about sediment? Well, we got this uh, traditional paper in the 83. We have a more modern paper, but basically the scenario the, was not changing at all. And is that uh, Asia produces a huge amount of sediments when compared with other continents. So this is the area we are studying now. It's Borneo and these islands here and, 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 and part of the Southeast uh, Continental Asia. So you can see that this small island, for example, produces a lot of tuff. This area here also produces a lot of tuff. But South America, despite having this big river, is not transferring this amount of uh, sediment to the ocean. Why should be happening that? should be a point. So this general map showing you that the sediment yield is not too big, but probably it's big, but the transferring of sediment is uh, more complicated because the geologic uh, and geomorphologic characteristic of the continent. But several authors, like Milliman and so on, have been insisting that we produce less at any scale in terms of drainage basins, right? Like in this diagram here, you have the drainage basin, is a sediment yield diagram and that we produce more than 4 billion tons. 20% or more of the sediment of the world transferred to the ocean came from this small island here. Well, <clears throat> so we started to analyze the Andes, and we published this paper. Uh, we were expecting it should be more popular. It's not as much as we were expecting it to be. But uh, <laughs> we I assessed it with my colleague Juan Restrepo from Colombia. The production of sediment in the Andes, mainly in the east uh, side, that is what this source in the big river. And we analyzed the real data with 100 to, uh, 119 stations with real uh, measurement of sediment. It's not just modeling, it's real measurement of sediments in, in the different countries. And we see that the Andes, of course, are very complex since uh, the morphotectonic point of view. They produce a lot of sediment sourcing these big systems uh, toward the east. 
And of course, uh, the sediment yield are highly variable. It's not that we have a uniform distribution. The northern Andes uh, produce uh, these values. Uh, in Peru, you see very low value. We are going to discuss in detail what is going on here. And after we have Bolivia that we increase, we increase in direction to the Chaco, and we start to decrease in direction to the south. So we go to the central Argentina that is more arid. We decrease the sediment yield despite the big elevation, and we move to the southern Andes and we decrease even more the production. So this is not regular. Uh, after, after we were confronting, we know the sediment yield with the drainage basins, and you can see also we have the same uh, cluster and so on, but particularly this is very interesting, the second one, the specific sediment yield with the specific mean annual water yield mean that some rivers, like in the Chaco, with not too much water can produce a lot of sediments, and on the other hand, in the rivers of Colombia, we can increase, increase precipitation, but we can more or less stable the production of sediments. So we see we got, uh, it's a consequence of the different regions, a different style and climate. And at least we produce some new numbers in how much we produce at mega scale in the Andes, in the different regions, and how much of this sediment is moving toward the uh, lowlands, right, through the main systems. And we got like uh, three points and in El gigatons of sediment produced on the east side of the Andes, and a certain portion of this is trapped in the Piedmont, and other part start to be exported through the main rivers. But the conclusion was that, in reality, the Andes produce as much sediment like other areas in the Himalayas or Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia was not an exception. The Himalayas were not an exception. And we produce more or less similar when we consider the Andes. And I, I published this before in 2005 in geomorphology in a paper that was one of the most my popular papers, Tropical River with Senia from India and Estebo from Brazil. And we told that in a very simple, you know, very simple figure like this, that more or less should be the same. But this confirmed really that um, we were more or less uh, correct at the time. And uh, so this is wrong. We produce as much as, than other oceanic uh, mountains in the world. And well, for example, oops, sorry, eh, the values can be significantly high in terms of sediment yield. You can see here more than 3,000 uh, tons uh, per square kilometer per year in some basic near to 5,000 tons per square kilometer per year. And this is the comparison on a global scale. You see Europe, how much produce. Uh, New Zealand, that also is considered a very productive area. We produce more. The big mountains produce more than many of these areas, the Himalayas and the Andes. But where is this uh, sediment transfer? Well, we have sinks, right? So the ultimate sink should be the ocean, but in between the ocean and the mountain, we have a lot of uh, uh, room to accommodate sediment. So how we explain these values in South America that are not so big is because we are storing sediment in the continents. And so where this sediment can be stored in the Piedmont, in mountain valleys, you know, in internally, in, well, in the mountains, can be stored in large rivers, can be stored in megafans, and can be stored in other kind of abulsive systems that are not typical megafans. Uh, and the first uh, approximation we got with Restrepo was a pretty, you know, a broad number. It's for 0 0.5 probably to 1.7 gigatons in the intramountain or surrounding proximal sedimentary basin where we consider the rivers that are draining toward the Atlantic. So what happened with the rest of the sediment? Well, we have the biggest alluvial megafans in the planet in South America, and the Chaco is where they develop. To have an idea in sedimentology, the most famous megafan is the Kosi in, in, in the indo gangetic Plain, the Kosi River megafan in India. Uh, you have in the office uh, the Okabango fan in, uh, in, in, in Africa. Well, the Pilkumashu megafan basically is 20 times bigger than the Kosi megafan in the indo gangetic Plain, right? So these uh, rivers, uh, Bermejo, Pilcomacho, uh, and so on, form extensive, big uh, uh, sedimentary, aggradational plain uh, uh, that extend more than 700 kilometers far away from the Andes. And the Pilcomacho 
carry about 140 million tons of sediment that never reach the Paraná River, that is the collector. All this sediment remain trapped in the Chaco Plain today. The Vermejo, that is also coming from the Andes, contributes with more than 100 million tons, 120, but 30 or 40 million tons can be tr uh, trapped, and the other, uh, the rest go to the Paraná River here, and it's still moving uh, through the main system toward the Atlantic. So to have an idea, Bermejo River means red, red in Spanish. So the Spanish put this name because we're so red because the sediment is this uh, river here, a very unstable river that has been a bullshit and uh, generated megafan. The concentration can be 440,000 uh, uh, milligrams per liter, uh, you know, to suspend the sediment. What other uh, sinks we have at planetary scale? Well, of course, uh, this, oops, this river from the Andes uh, got uh, big sedimentary yields in the upper catchment. But when we go to the Kratons and the uh, uh, highland of Brazil, for example, here, they don't produce too much. So the sediment yields are significantly smaller. This is 15 to 40 tons per square kilometer per year of sediment yield, and this is more than, you know, 2,000. So, but anyway, we have a space to trap sediment as well, and the Pantanal of Mato Grosso is also a sink of sediment. So we have big megafans, some of the biggest megafans of the planet are also here, but this is a more kind of keratonic environment, and we have a trapping of sediment of a few million tons of sediment, uh, eight million tons, if we estimate, is trapped every year in the Pantanal because of these megafans, right? Another option we have to store uh, this amount of sediment are about the rivers. So they are not typical megafam, but they are very unstable, like used to be, for example, the Mississippi during the Holocene. And this is happening with rivers in the Beni Plain in Bolivia. So these are the rivers that uh, we are talking about. Sinus River, very unstable. They accommodate a lot of sediment by lateral migration and transfer into the plain. And uh, have been estimated by other authors, it's not my number, but that we have been taken there from the literature and colleagues, that probably more than 200 million tons, 280 million tons can be stored in the Bolivian plains. Uh, another example is a Bulsi River here in Colombia, in the Magdalena Basin, in the foreland of the Andes, we have a tectonic uh, basin that is called the Mompox, Mompocina uh, Tectonic Basin, uh, the river create this crazy uh, uh, anabranching system, and uh, we store probably near 20 million tons per year also in this area. We don't have, this is very another challenge that we have, we don't have yet the estimation on how much sediment is trapped in the Orinoco Plain. So this is something that probably is going to be several hundred million tons produced in the Andes. It's a very productive area here, but we don't know too much about that. Uh, a big discussion in geology have been, okay, well, you know, the, we store all this in a Bullseye River, we store everything in, 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 in uh, megafans, but uh, we don't store materials in axial rivers. So this is a big confrontation with the same groups, is how, what, uh, how we store sediment and what can be preserved in the geological record. And I say, well, uh, the, we can preserve, of course, in axial rivers. Uh, a lot of sediments, of course, it's a different nature, a different style, but today, how much we are restoring in the big rivers? And this is the question. So, for example, uh, when we consider the Amazon River, uh, Tom Dunning started with this estimation in 98, a very close friend, we are working together in some of these projects, and he said that, well, probably we can get 500 million tons of storage along the whole river. This is a lot of sediment. And we can exchange more than 2 billion tons of sediment in all these processes of exchange between the channel and the flat plain. And this will keep alive the ecosystem and all this stuff. Well, uh, we have been doing a lot of uh, studies uh, with the field-based studies and calibrating models with remote sensing. And so, for example, in the lower reach, we are coming out with a new estimation that at least 100 million tons of sediment are restored every year in the flat plain of the Amazon. This is a remote sensing model. Uh, with the concentration of sediment, suspended sediment concentration, and the distribution in the flat plain. So it's a lot of sediment still being stored every year in the lower reaches of the Amazon. 
In the case of the Parana River, another big river, also we are storing huge amount of sediments. So in this river, this is another of the, our models, also it's calibrated with field information. What we have is that the transference to the floodplain can reach in some areas 17 to 60 million tons of sediment per year. So the rivers are not really in equilibrium. Bed load can be in equilibrium, but not so suspended low. We are is these are very active sedimentary basins today, right? We are trapping, trapping, trapping sediment. This sediment here is coming mainly from a small tributary of the Andes, right? Practically nothing is coming from Brazil. This is a small tributary that is the Vermejo River contribute with 90% of the wash load of this gigantic river. This river is 18 cubic, 18,000, sorry, 18,000 cubic, and the Bermejo is 300, but pro introduce 90% of the sediment to the system. So all the La Plata River story depend of this. Well, we have been modifying. This is more interesting for many of you, but I was attending, you know, this balance between more general geologic and stuff with the environmental issues. We have been modifying all these fluxes. What I'm trying to show you is what we have in the general picture. What the human have been modifying this in South America, mainly like in other parts of the tropic with dams, an extreme change in deforestation, land cover changes, right? These are the two main factors. In deforestation, what we have, this is, uh, you know, we have uh, here the different areas. Uh, we have some plus uh, symbols here. What we have been doing is increasing the erosion of these areas, increasing erosion. And uh, the two typical cases are the Magdalena Basin in the north and the Araguaia Basin in central Brazil, an area that you have been visiting with us. And um, in the Magdalena, uh, my friend Juan Restrepo has been developing a lot of work there. We have an increase in the sediment transport, increasing more than 44 million tons uh, during the last uh, years, and increase of the erosion rates probably, you know, in 34% in the whole basin because extreme deforestation in the basin. Colombia has been suffering a lot in terms of uh, deforestation during the last decade. These are the maps of uh, deforestation from the 80s to uh, 2000. Uh, another area that has been suffering a lot of modification we mentioned before is the Araguaya. We produce a budget for this uh, river. It's a very nice river and a branching system with a lot of sandy load, right? Uh, it's pretty big. This is the mean discharge and the drainage area used to be as much bigger than used to be the Nile. Of course, the Nile now is, is practically nothing because of the dams, but the natural Nile um, to give, give you a sense of a scale. So this is a, in central Brazil, this is the part that we have been studying mainly and this uh, yellow color is the Cerrado biome. That can be in 70% of the Cerrado was basically gone because the expansion of salt bean, sugar cane, and so on. So this river transports a lot of sand, but think about the expansion of agriculture. This is a deforestation in red. Happened in 30 years, 35 years, gone. The natural vegetation. So this thick regolith that we have in central Brazil was very susceptible to erosion. Big galleys like this develop. So we have a massive uh, source of sediment toward the system. And the system has to start to redistribute this. And we're doing this, you know, changing a little the geomorphologic style, increasing the capacity of transport by adjustment of uh, cross-section, slope, and so on. And have been storing in different type of environment sediment. So we consider that at least 230 million tons of sediment were stored in 35 years uh, in the middle Araguaya uh, basin, right? And you see that the sediment load have been increasing uh, as well. This is the net, net storage along the river, but this is the bed load transport as well. And the bed load also was increasing through time and you can see in this diagram as well the deforestation, right? Deforestation, uh, sedimentation, sediment transport. And this is interesting because it's the gross domestic products of the counties in the basin that are linked to agriculture, cattle ranch. So have been more or less following the similar path with the expansion of the agricultural uh, and cattle ranch uh, frontier. 
uh, one of the criticisms was say, well, why is not climate change? What we are doing is increasing this chart and we move more sediment because of the reason. Well, we have been doing some uh, complementary study with Mike Coy from the Woodhall, he's a specialist in modeling, for hydrological modeling. And we came up that the, in this publication that at least two thirds percent of the variability in discharge, of the, that this near 28% in, in, in 35 years, is a consequence of deforestation effect, it's not climate change. So that confirmed our original uh, theory. And it's what we have here, a rate of 7 million tons of accumulation per year that is trapping the continent is not exiting to the ocean. Well, we have the opposite. In San Asia, we produce much because that, but then we have dams that produce different effects. These are trapping sediments, right? And we know that dams are giving a main beeline for rivers around the world. And we have this kind of uh, general uh, studies at global scale that have been very useful. Uh, showing, uh, well, what is uh, going on in different parts of the planet? Um, because we know that dams produce a lot of uh, negative effects on rivers. Uh, alteration of the hydrological regime, sediment regime, morphodynamics, ecology, and so on. However, when you get uh, these kind of figures, there are full uh, plenty of mistakes, right? Uh, you can see that this is a nonsense for South America. Uh, we repeat and repeat that we use and we teach with this stuff. That's the problem. We are not familiar with the river we are working with. We don't have absolutely 60 or 80 percent of trapping in the Paraná. We don't have 80 to 100 percent trapping in the Orinoco River. This is totally wrong, right? I will show you some uh, details. So we have to analyze more in detail what is going on in terms of that before just uh, looking at secondary data and playing with computers. So look at this uh, example of what is going on with the rivers in central uh, Brazil. Uh, or Central South America, so you want. Uh, they had big basins that are born in the Cerrado, the Paraná River, the San Francisco, and the Tocantins River, some of the biggest rivers of the continent. And they are paid practically until the construction of dams in the Amazon, good part of the energy of Brazil, was generated by dams in this region, basically, fundamentally. Right? And <clears throat> you see that the Paraná River, for example, was totally affected by dam and it's still affected with more dams. This is from my colleague, José Estebo, a specialist in the, in, the, in the Paraná River. So you see this is a cascade of dams all interconnected. And practically, the whole river is regulated from the border with Argentina to upstream Sao Paulo. Uh, <clears throat> so this river is totally destroyed. There's 100% basically of the sediment is trapped. Nothing pass downstream to Argentina today. But this river was uh, having not too much sediment yield. Remember that this is in the Craton, so we're sourcing mainly uh, sandy material and not too much suspended load. Uh, now the perspective is even worse because this is what we expect to make more pressure on these guys. The San Francisco is totally regulated as well. We have some studies there. Uh, the Araguaya, you know, many people is working here on the Tocantins basin is also affected by dams. But we expect probably go beyond 1,000 dams in the Cerrado if the tendency continues in Brazil in terms of uh, uh, dams construction. So this is the reality we are facing uh, now in the, in the area. What about the Amazon? So we published this paper uh, recently, uh, dam in the uh, rivers of the Amazon basin. So of course the Cerrado never got the attention that got the Amazon. But in the Amazon was uh, also a very uh, difficult situation because hundreds of dams were planned to be built in the Amazon. So we were trying to come up with some results and, you know, some big picture to say, please uh, pay attention, uh, this can be a serious issue. And you have to consider that such a mega scale system, stuff can be interrelated and the problem that you create here can be transferred over there, over there, and be transformed in a global scale problem. So that was the spirit of this. So I got a bunch of uh, very good colleagues and friends that compromised. Uh, you committed with, the, with this uh, cause. Uh, people from fluvial geomorphology, ecologists, economists, uh, planners, uh, and so on. And <clears throat> so what was going on is we have a hundred of them planted in different areas of the Andes in the Cratonic Sound. So we have the cratonic shields here. It's in no very high uh, areas, as you know. 
not too much sediment yields, and these areas in the Andes with a lot of sediment yield. So the realities, geographic and geologic realities, geomorphological realities, are different. Um, so <clears throat> what can happen in cratonic rivers, like the Tapajos and Xingu? Well, we suggest that, of course, here the flat pulses can be modified by these dams. So these are clear and black water rivers with low sediment load. So the sediment load is mainly bed low. Hmm? So all these biotic communities depend on flat pulses. They don't have very big flat plains in general, these kind of rivers. Um, and Xingu and Tapajos are the most important cases. Xingu got a lot of attention of the press because the social conflicts. Simon know very well this have been working for years with this problem. But the focus was on this guy, but not too much about other basins that were also in risk. So I believe since the hydrophysical point of view, well, this is problematic, but this is not the most problematic case. The most problematic case is the Tapajos, since the hydrophysical point of view. This is also a very big tributary. We have here the lobby of the government telling that hydroelectric power is very good. Hydroelectric is the bank because we produce clean energy and so on. But this should be impossible to develop in any developed country in the planet. So you link all these uh, reservoirs here, we can get an area in pond area with the more land than the Mississippi from Memphis to New Orleans. Nobody should be building this in the North America or in Europe or in any place of the world in the 21st century, right? And well, this is what is going on with this uh, system, what they planned to do, right? It's a very, very serious issue. What happened with the Andean basins? Well, in the Andes, I say it's more a catchment bit headache because we saw that the sediment yields are very high, and we are sourcing all this system with sediments coming from the Andes, right? So size is not the warranty that you have, okay, no, I'm going to put just a small dam in, in a small tributary. Well, depend what tributary we are talking about. So <clears throat> good part of the dam that were planted in the Andes were subsidized by the National Bank of Development of Brazil, uh, to be built by Brazilian companies. And the energy was not to be used by this country. It was used to be exported to uh, Brazil when Brazil was very optimistic in terms of growing. And now, you know, uh, the situation is uh, <laughs> more complex. <laughs> but well, this was, a, this was the original idea. So think about that. Here, we export more or less 400 or 450 million tons toward the Ucayali, Marañón, yeah, uh, 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 bottlenecks here toward the Amazon, and we export probably 500 to 600 uh, million tons through the Madeira. It's like this. Uh, all Western Amazon here is isolated. We are not transferring nothing from the Andes here. It's going here or here, right? So <clears throat> if we cut this, all of this downstream is going to be affected. And Brazil didn't uh, pay attention to that because building this is going to affect all the ecosystem downstream <coughs> in Brazilian uh, territory. Think about that some of these areas are thousands of uh, uh, tons per square kilometer per, uh <coughs> per year of sediment yield, right? This is the, the key situation. Peru is a very serious uh, case because remember I shown you that in Peru, we got a very bad number for sediment yield. It was uh, lower than in other areas of the Andes. It's not, it's not real, it's fake numbers. The problem is that we don't have data, right? So this area with the minimum amount of data is where we are planning to concentrate the biggest amount of dams. It's crazy, right? It's an area with less information where the people is planning more dams. Right? Here we are, this area, Peru, and no sediment transport production data for these catchments. This uh, system down, uh, 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 this Demadeira River, is the main tributary of the Amazon. It's huge. And Brazil built in record time two mega dams that are considered the biggest 
run of river mega dams in the planet in operation. So they can generate significant, in theory, amount of uh, power. We have here in megawatt how much they can produce. And at the point where the Amazon, uh, where the dams were built here in Western Amazon, the mud data transport more water discharged at the Yangtze River in Sri Gorge, right? And probably more sediment. I know Sri Gorge. But Sri Gorge, you have a space to accommodate this kind of issue. Here, the maximum elevation is 90 meters above sea level. So you don't have any margin to mistake here. You can accommodate basically nothing. <coughs> OK? Sorry, my boy's gone. It's the end of the semester after teaching the whole semester. <laughs> well, <coughs> to have an idea about our heritage, uh, people working in our network and other collaborators identify more than 1,000 species of fish in this area. And this were the second largest rapids in the world in water this year. It was a paradise for, you know, potential tourism in, in the future. Nobody was uh, giving the value to that. Thank you very much. Right? The second largest rapids of the war in water this year after the Congo. Hmm? Disappear. Doesn't exist. Well, try the Mississippi water discharge, right? Well, uh, we have studied uh, the impact of the dam. Uh, this is just a few results that we include in this paper. We have a lot of more. And this is the suspended sediment concentration, how much was affected by the dam. And we start to notice that there is a decrease of uh, some percent, uh, you know, the, you know, can be you know, 10, 10, 20 percent. But this is only wash load. This is clay and silt. <coughs> The idea, uh, the modeling the, from other authors, and maybe we can come up with some number with David and with you, is that probably 97 or 95% of the sand is not passing currently uh, the dumps. <coughs> okay? Because uh, we are over uh, producing the rotation of, uh, <coughs> of the fine sediments. So, the, the paper also produced this kind of map to help uh, the, you know, uh, the discussion with uh, people beyond the science, uh, decision makers, and so on. And we combined different indices. I'm not going to t talk about that. But the idea was to produce some maps indicating how much vulnerable these basins are uh, to different environmental uh, factors. We include here a basin integrity index that considers how much can be how much is deforested, how much is preserved, how much can be even transformed in the future years in terms of land use. Uh, we combine this with the fluvial dynamics index, basic hydrology, flood pulses, but also sediment transport, uh, channel uh, migration, and so on. That I think that does make a big difference with previous uh, authors and previous uh, methodologies. Um, putting this more uh, geomorphologic, morphodynamic uh, issue. And of course, the direct impact by dam, how much dam, what, how many tributaries, blah, blah, blah. And the Madeira is the most uh, threatened river. Uh, the Tapajos and the Ucayali and Marañon as well are at the big risk. I could say that they should be the most uh, critical basins today uh, in the basin. Uh, well, this is something that. Uh, we conclude. Uh, who is triggering this environmental disaster? Uh, well, uh, Brazil and China. This is the point. Uh, Brazil have been offering for many years uh, easy credit uh, with the National Bank of Development. Uh, the Chinese have been entering mainly in Ecuador after fighting with the Brazilians. Uh, the Brazilians started there, uh, were in conflicts. So, we have been criticizing, you know, in many countries of Latin America for years, the methodology of the World Bank and FMI. Well, they impose us. Well, we are doing worse in some way because we give you the credit, but you have to hire my company. You cannot even call to international, you know, uh, competition. So all these guys here, the big companies from Brazil, Odebrecht, Andrade Gutierrez, Camargo Correa, also mentioned horrible scandal of corruption, legal issues. They have been the guy building all this infrastructure in many of the Latin American countries, Central, well, and, and even Africa as well. 
very simple recipe. You take the loan with me, I make the construction for you, and you, after you pay me, exporting the energy. It was pretty simple. What we were trying to call the attention is the mega scale impacts. If we cut all these sediment fluxes and so on, also we are going to affect other areas that uh, were not considered in the equation, like the Amazon plume and the Atlantic coast. So we know that today we have all the sediment that arrive to the coast and is transferred toward the north of South America by different, you know, complex processes, coastal uh, 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 processes that produce the dispersion of this plume that finally coalesce with the Orinoco plume uh, towards uh, the Caribbean zone. It's a big area of sedimentation that uh, feed with mud all the northern coast, uh, northeast coast of South America. Uh, and we have here some of the most uh, preserved and uh, big, de strongly developed areas of mangrove uh, in the continent. Correct? Um, there is a lot of uh, also issues here in terms of the economy of this uh, production of fish and uh, local economies are served by this uh, uh, amount of uh, nutrient that uh, exit the Amazon uh, in the coastal area of Brazil. Uh, so what happens if we are trapping this? Well, <coughs> we have been trying to show the people that, well, see so you are living in Pará, in the Amazon state, you start to be affected by what happened upstream. As you were living in French Guiana, you are French. France has to be involved in the discussion as well because we are going to decrease the sediment and we are going to affect all your uh, coastal zone. Uh, to have an idea, uh, people in the University of Texas doing climatic modeling, the Jackson School, have been demonstrating that the plume produces a thermal anomaly in the, in the Atlantic. Yeah? It's a change in sur surface temperature. And this tropical storm that developed in this area, right, uh, depend of this plume. So if we modify this, the, the path of uh, these uh, storms is affected by this, uh, by this anomaly. And we can affect also the path and the distribution of tropical storm from this area toward the Caribbean Sea and the Gulf of Mexico. This is what they were trying to demonstrate. There's a lot of teleconnection that we have to consider on the table. This is part of the, our simulation with the model of, uh, of uh, uh, suspended sediment concentration. Let's see if this works. It never worked, right? When they put this. No? It's a video. Yeah. It's working. Ooh. So this is the crease that we expect. Uh, we are in the different uh, you know, scenarios. We are trapping 30%, 40%, whatever percent. Of course, you can make all the criticism you want to this. The concentration is correct. This is the distribution we have in the plume with the kind of sediments from the Amazon. So each region is not a generic model. This region is calibrated for, uh, this model is calibrated for the Amazon. But you can argue that, well, so we change the discharge here, we can uh, modify a little the dispersion of sediment and all this stuff. We have a specialist here in this kind of topic, of course. But this gives you a general idea of what can happen at what scale. It's just a, the objective of this. Uh, well, and here we are. What is next? Uh, I'm very glad, and you know, it's, it's, a, it's a privilege for me to be part of this uh, Amazon Dam Network. I think it's a terrific uh, uh, initiative, uh, trying to put people from different disciplines together, people that is committed with the, this problem. Uh, and uh, we have been advancing as well with this new paper by David and uh, he, his students, uh, going deeper in the hydrological aspects and what can happen if we build more dams and seeing that we were missing, what is the cumulative effect of the different projects, right? So I think this is fantastic. We have very good starting point, particularly in the hydrophysical aspects, combining what we have been doing, this kind of approach, and going to a specific you know, solving specific issues. Uh, basically, that is what I have. This is the final conclusion. Uh, so I presented the general fluxes in the continent, uh, how they are going, yeah, suffering modification by dams and deforestation. We have now a starvation 
in many of the coastal areas of Brazil, this minus here means that we have erosion, lack of sediment in the coastal zone. We have increase of uh, erosion in the central part of Brazil. We have accumulation inland in active sedimentary basin, like the Bananal Basin here I shown you in the Araguaia. Uh, we have a sedimentation in the Mompocina Basin that has been accelerated in the Magdalena because the increased erosion in the Colombian Andes. We have increase of erosion in the Chaco area. So now we have been trapping sediments in many basins. For example, 80, 90, 100 percent of the sediment in the Cratonic Zone is not reaching the ocean. But we didn't modify the fluxes in the Paraná Basin because we decrease the source from here, but we increase the source of wash load from here. So the numbers are still to be the same, right? Uh, just a minute, I know probably I'm beyond the time, but uh, this case is very important. We discussed today, this morning. This is one example that the very small river can be fundamental. This is small river, 300 cubics, against a big guy of 18,000 cubics, introduced today 90% of the sediment that feed the most amazing floodplain in the planet, in my opinion, that this is the Paraná, is a more spectacular even than the Amazon, and the, practically the biggest estuary, or one of the biggest estuaries, like is the La Plata River, all depend of this small river. Some of the tributaries of the river have sediment yield of 18,000 tons per square kilometer, like Pescado River. See, we dam this small guy. Look at the catastrophe that we produce in damming just a small river, right? So, well, continuing this, uh, persisting this model of development, forget the natural condition of the Amazon, and in two, three decades, the impact is going to be catastrophic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, <laughs> student, you know. <laughs> with the discharge of uh, 300 cubic meters per second. Um, wouldn't you have a mess like the San, San Manchia Dam in China that filled like within four years if you, if you tried to build a dam on that system? Uh, yeah, I believe that's correct. Yeah, and the megawatts that it generated, it was supposed to be, I think, 1,800, and it ended up, now it's generating like 25. Because it's just just chunk full of sediment, so I think uh, somebody who some communicators are needed to sort of get this information across. That you know, look at what happened in China when they built this in the 60s. Um, we don't want to repeat this mess over here because we're not generating electricity. If that's what you want. <laughs> so, yeah. I had a question about the maps you generated uh, for the nature paper. Was the goal to kind of inform policymakers? And if so, would your recommendation be that they continue damming the areas that are already highly impacted or to dam the areas that are less vulnerable? Well, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the major objective was informed to the you know, broad public, uh, decision maker, making aware to people across disciplines, what was going on, and trying to put on discussion the scale of the problem. Because we always were focus, making focus on study cases. But now on this big picture, all these fluxes at continental scale. So that was the idea. Uh, and for that, we produced these uh, uh, general maps. It can be interpreted for anyone. So you don't have to be a specialist in physics or or hydrological modeling, or it doesn't seem that you can understand, right? Uh, so yes, this was the idea. And I repeat, the, uh, fortunately, the second part of the paper is you know, attracting people too much. Because normally when I present, the people that attend are scientists. But the second part is something that we have to discuss, is where we propose an alternative for basin management. 
And say that's the most important part of the paper, more than, of course, this is more attractive because we like it or whatever. Mm -hmm. But the second part is how we can come up with some suggestion in terms of basic management. Uh, so, yeah, but this was the target, was, you know, producing some motion. Uh, because we have the in favor or against. In fa we don't have nothing in between. Thank you so much, Edgardo. That, that was wonderful, really. Um, so when you listed the main factors affecting the tropical rivers in South America, you listed uh, dams and deforestation and land use change. I wonder where uh, climate change fits into this, like, two main factors. Is it a third factor? Is it a factor that interacts with whatever existing dams or land use and deforestation? Or And, and, and then following up on that, how climate change, uh, what, what's the role of climate change in this, um, maybe exacerbating this, this uh, threats and risks that you synthesize in your talk? Excellent question. You know, I think it's a fundamental one. Because, <coughs> yeah, we have all the discussion about climate change, and we have been investing millions of dollars in projects and so on in climate change. In my opinion, uh, climate change is a secondary element. The velocity of change that we produce here and the impact is so dramatic, right? It's today. And <clears throat> we know that good part of the, of the disasters uh, here in Asia, whatever, are not because climate change. It's because we have been doing very bad planning, right? And occupying areas of rigs, creating a disaster in terms of how we manage the environment. And <clears throat> this used to be what we call in the 90s global change. Remember the definition with UNESCO. And global change, I like it because it was more holistic. And after we, no, we, we shift this discussion just to atmospheric issues. And it was very dangerous because now the politician can blame the climate change because of a problem that they don't you know, take care of. Oh, no, it is climate change. It's not my, not my fault. The fault is the Americans or the Chinese. Yes, emissions. And, and, and for the tropics, climate change discussion have been very bad. Why? Because it was triggering the construction of dams. When say hydroelectric has the ban, it's because we are producing green energy. Well, but you are damming the most uh, biodiverse river of the planet. You can think about it. We have to build a dam in Alaska, and it's a scandal because we have the salmon. Well, we have thousands of species. In, in, <laughs> in the Madeira, right? So that's my problem. And the result that we have, for example, in the um, Araguaya and in other rivers for other people, the changes are mainly because land use change, uh, not because climate change. The main driver was not climate change. When we have, for example, the result by my colleague Juan Restrepo, it's a very good job in, in Colombia, and he insists with the same, please don't still use climate change because it's going to kill us. All the politicians use climate change. It's, it's perfect for them, right? And in the Magdalena and all this area, we have been doing several work in collaboration as well. The problem has been not uh, climate change at all. It's uh, land use change. It's a uh, channelization that are very bad transferring sediment to the coral reefs and, you know, in the coastal zone and all these issues. I don't know if you answer your question. You talk about time scales of change in sedimentology, like in the Araguaya case, this sort of large scale deforestation leading to observable changes in, in flux. And then also in the sort of the basin in general, this idea that this floodplain isn't full yet. Um, and so you have this basically this capacity. So Maybe thinking about those two cases, what are the time scales? Like, what, are these rivers close to being in some sort of equilibrium? Are we decades? Are we hundreds of years? Are we thousands of years away to equilibrium in these systems? Or good, yeah. good question. Uh, well, <coughs> a natural scale. Uh, many of the big rivers are in. So we consider not only bed low, but wash lower in this in this equilibrium. Uh, some exceptions. You go to the Indo-Ganesetic plain. Well, the space was not too much in terms of these uh, basins. So 
this was filled of sediment pretty fast. So the system is still moving quasi equilibrium in Southeast Asia, the area I'm studying now. But these guys were not having time enough since the last glacier to fill up all this stuff. Right? Uh, so at this time, we scaled this river are in this equilibrium. Um, the Araguaya, the sedimentary basin was full, so the response is just to short term. So in the big rivers, like are in all today in this equilibrium, if we include more this equilibrium, we have to combine both. In rivers that are more in almost quasi-equilibrium condition, like the used to be the Araguaya, we were surprised with the time of reaction of the river because it's so big and and was pretty fast. So the impact of deforestation was not having too much uh, lack time of, uh, in terms of reaction uh, in, uh, in morphology and was ex extending for hundreds of kilometers. So this was a big surprise because you know very well, John, that uh, we didn't know too much about the time of reaction of big system. Good part of the data came from the smaller catchment. Okay, I produce deforestation here, and, and the river react like that. The surprise was in 34 years, 40 years, the river really react, adapting and producing some kind of metamorphism in, 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 in long distances. And probably now, it's reaching kind of a quasi equilibrium condition again, but with a different style. In terms of ecosystem, for example, it's something that we never really publish and explore because we need more interactions. The fluvial bar change. So the river used to, to trans transport, you know, a uh, lot of lateral bars and more stable island and was modified to transport more sand in the smaller bars and more middle channel bars and the lateral bars decrease. So for the people that are not familiar with this, nothing very significant. Well, the turtles, they prefer the lateral bars. They don't prefer the middle channel bars because they are abrupt, they are coarse material. They, so we have a lot of changes like that. Uh, the colonization of plants, the, the pioneer plant, also were, was, was changing the dynamic because we were changing the morphology. And it's not... Uh, extreme, like how we can see in small catchments, you know, the river metamorphosis in the United States on this agricultural land, ah, but it's there. Yeah. I was just wondering if you had some um, thoughts about, I'm not a geomorphologist, but the impact of geomorphology now on the Madeira um, floods that happened and the role that s in the future that sediment changes might have in that system. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we have a lot of study in the Madeira. And uh, we did it at least, uh, well, I have been working for many years in the river, but more lately, five big expeditions collecting information and surveying the Madeira. <laughs> with my students and collaborators. And <coughs> yeah, we have an analysis of all the dynamic platform change and, and this kind of issue. The problem is that uh, in the case of the dams, uh, you want to see the effects. The Madeira River uh, have a pretty simplified channel. So we compare it with others. It's a pretty straight, not too much complex and a branching structure. Um, is remember the equilibrium condition. The flat plain is, is full of sediment today. We don't have capacity to accommodate basically nothing downstream the dams. Because remember that when the river crossed the area of the dams, it's crossing a late Pleistocene terrace and nick points in rock, right? So in this area, the river is totally confined. That's the reason they were building this. But when we move downstream Porto Velho, the flat plain is still narrow. And it's very cohesive. We have a lot of clay and so on there, that is very cohesive. It's not moving laterally. And sometimes it's touching even tertiary, tertiary rocks that confine even more the, 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 the flow. So the river is like reworking in three or four and abranching a structure of the sediment through time. In a few decades, boom, boom, boom. Yeah, you see changes, but always it's still the same. Pam, 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 pam. We don't detect in recent years significant change. 
we have a very, very small change in some parameters, the morphological parameters. Not too much. Another problem is that we don't have to, com for comparison, bathymetric surveys in this river, because in this case, we can expect probably more vertical adjustment that we don't see. Remember that many of these rivers have a lot of uh, uh, depressions, right? It's, 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 it's scours. So in the some areas of the um, Madeira, we, we got 60 meters in depth. But the river normally is 10 meters. So you can start to exaggerate these kind of uh, features in the bed. So we, we cannot follow that. So I'm not expecting in the Madeira too much plant form changes. Because if not, probably should be st starting to happen today. But we can transfer maybe downstream, more remotely, the problem. And for sure, we are going to affect the wheat, modify more the fluxes. The most complicated system probably is not the Madeira, but we transfer downstream to the Amazon. Because the lower Amazon downstream the Madeira, I told you that we are trapping 100 million tons. Good part of the sediment trapped by the Amazon are coming from the Madeira, near 40, 50 percent. So these guys are going to be more affected downstream than even the proximal reaches in the dam. Uh, you hinted before about uh, how the challenges with getting good data, in particular Peru, when you're talking about the Western Andes. Uh, with that graph you showed, uh, maybe discuss uh, the quality of data, where it was good, where it wasn't so good, and, um, you know, well, you had to bribe anybody, or what did you have to do to <laughs> sort of get that good data set? Well, no, we, we produced this for the Andes. We were using basically national agencies. So I'm trying to filter what should be possible to do. For example, the sediment uh, information from Brazil s looks abundant. But in general, it's uh, very bad, right? Uh, so you have to, to filter uh, what we have. In Peru, unfortunately, it's very small was available. That's the reality. Because uh, we got better data from the other country, even Bolivia. Because there were more studies with the f by the French there. In Peru, it was incipient. Uh, Ecuador, we got better. And Colombia had better information. Argentina, of course, had better information. Uh, so it was, uh, that's the problem. So to improve it, you need really to start to monitor more seriously this issue. Again, as a terrestrial biologist, excuse this question, but I just find that shocking that, you know, if you're going to construct a dam or something, it would seem that sediment flows would be one of the first things you'd want to know about. So why is, is it just really hard data to collect, or why, is, why are we lacking these kinds of data? Yeah, this is what we were discussing with uh, David. Uh, the problem is that uh, who have been influential in this discussion? Uh, we mentioned climate change. For climate change, all this is a kind of pixel, right? You know, some modeling. But in terms of uh, ecology, Remember that the big paradigm in, in Brazil, in the tropics and so on, was the flood pores. And it was very difficult to remove, you know, to push the ecologies outside this comfort zone. So always flood, flood pores, and always hydrology. And always biodiversity. What? Hydrology, hydrology, hydrology. And we got, uh, for dams, the country was calling for projects that was looking for uh, ecologic uh, discharges, environmental flows. So never would they consider the river like some uh, other kind of alive creature <laughs> that uh, move, that have this mosaic that depend not only of water but the other issues, right? And uh, well, the, the, the ecologists that should be the guys to push more this discussion were not pushing that because they were doing basically eco hydrology. Mm -hmm. And so it was, it was in the terms of uh, contracts, everything is enough. And 
for the guys that were building the dam was perfect. You know, nobody was questioning that. You know, I said, okay, good. So why not? You have what you want. Mm -hmm. right. That was the point. But it is expensive to collect. It's expensive, and, uh, but I mean, at least, you know, I was a consultant for the Geological Survey of Brazil in this area of the Madeira. I was at the beginning a consultant for Furnas. I worked with the Geological Survey for years. You know what the Geological Survey did to approve the environmental impact assessment here? Got my maps from the Brazil Bolivia ecological zoning. There was nothing to do with dams at the time. They copied this stuff. They captured a couple of uh, images of satellite and confront. Of course, the river is not moving at all because it was confined. And say, that's the geomorphological study. <laughs> Go ahead, build it, and we recommend you building this. This is the ge geological survey. And you probably know the person, Adami and the others. And I told these guys, say, you are irresponsible. I worked with you for many years. This is wrong. No, it's okay. okay. It's okay. So there was nothing in between the basic, uh, you know, designed by the engineers and just the people doing mainly fish or this kind of fish. Nobody wanted to know that. No, no, and I denounced that. There was also an article in National Geographic uh, that was, I was trying to push this guy. I was really discussing with them. I have been working with them for many years. And say, no, it's okay. And now we have, they have the problem. So now they are regretting it. Edgardo, we need to end now because yeah. you have another meeting. Please, uh, yes. I'm that not. Uh, <laughs> thank you so well, much. Thank you very much. Thank you